Greetings and salutations, good friends. Uh, hope everybody is doing well. As you heard on the intro, if you're looking at the, um, if you're listening to this rather on the podcast, can't really look at the podcast. Um, you know we are in the middle of our series, and if you're watching on YouTube, here we are, and I'm letting you know we are about three parts deep into our series on God's nature. I highly recommend going and um, watching slash listening to the other sessions before this because there is buildup, there, there is context, there are some things that we're talking about that will lead into this next discussion, and if you're picking up in the middle, uh, you might be a little lost or even get to, you know, sort of a a wrong, wrong feel or wrong answer as to what we're doing here. Um, if you haven't been, uh, you know, kind of in the know, listening to and, and following along. So highly recommend you go and look at that, look at the rest of the videos in this playlist and um, watch them in succession. Or if you're on the podcast services like Spotify, again, find the, uh, the God's Nature series and listen to those um, from the first till now. Uh, we talked through the um, biblical understanding of of God, monotheism, theism, um, and how God um, shows Himself to be that way as as one, a singularity, a singular God. There are no other gods, even though yes, in the scriptures we can talk of you know Elohim and things like that, but there was only one divine Yahweh. And we looked at Old Testament and New Testament scriptures to support that. Then we moved into the idea of Jesus as the God-Man. This is the this is where we're going to start parsing out the different um, views that we've been um, putting in context here: Trinitarianism, Biblical Unitarianism, and Oneness. And I I do believe that the the scriptures indicate Jesus appropriately. Um, identified as deity, as God, because of the uh, the various scriptures that we went through last time. And you can go, again, look at that. And I have said this, I think, on every podcast so far on this series. I don't think that our understanding of God's nature, I don't think people can fully 100% comprehend everything there is to know about God, although we can comprehend exactly what He's revealed in His Word. So it's not like, oh, God is just this mystery out there. We just cannot even fathom. We can't fit him into our little brains. Well, we can fit what he has revealed to us and explained to us into our brains. That's why he did it. Um, but I don't think we can just fully understand and comprehend everything there is to know about God. And I think that we need to have some grace and some leeway for people that don't see it exactly like us and only go as far as the Scripture does. If the Scripture says this is essential to know or this is essential to believe about God, then let the Scripture speak for itself, but I don't think we should go, uh, you know, um, rabbit hunting for Scriptures to um, condemn people into heresy and this kind of thing just because they don't see God's nature exactly like us. I talked a little bit already, and I won't do too much here, even in the boat of, say, let's take Trinitarianism. There are easily a half dozen to a dozen different views on truth. You can say, I am a firm, strong Trinitarian, and there are half a dozen wildly different ways to look at the Trinity. Um, we talked a little bit about this last time. There are lots of Trinitarians who believe in the eternal generation of the Son, and there are many, many who do not, including big names and even apologists who debate and all kinds of stuff, they do not believe in what some would consider a critical, crucial doctrine. And so there's lots of variety and lots of variation. Go watch um, the one that we did last time because I talk a little bit more about that and what I believe the Scripture actually says as an answer for the eternal generation of the Son. This time around, we're going to pick up with um, some of the some of the idea of Jesus and some of the things that He said and, and kind of Him um, in relation to the Father. Because last time we did sort of um, go through John chapter 14, and talk quite a bit about uh, Jesus, the duality, the man, and how that works with the Father, and all of that. And we, you know, John 14, I think, has a lot to say and is good on that, so go watch the one we just did. And now we're going to pick up in 1 Corinthians 8 and 6. Many people believe that this is sort of a, um, well, I'll just read it first. <laughs> 
keep commenting here before we even get into the scriptures. 1 Corinthians 8 and 6 says, Yet for us there is but one God, the Father, from whom all things came, and for whom we live. And there is but one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things came, and through whom we live. Now, if you were to read this and say, okay, to the, you know, the, to the to the standard sort of person, just say, hey, who um who is who is the one God? That's a question, right? On a test. Who is the one God? And we were to read that scripture for us, right? Speaking of the New Testament church, the ecclesia, those who are called, um, set apart, sanctified, all that. For us, there's but one God, the Father from whom all things came, and for whom all things are, for whom we live, and there is but one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things came, and through whom we live. So it's pretty easy. The one God is the Father, and it's not that complicated. It becomes more complicated as we build in man-made traditions and creeds and um, that kind of thing. But if we don't go to that stuff, we don't go to that, we just go to Scripture, it's not that complicated. Um, John chapter 14, verse 28, Jesus speaking, he says, You heard me say, I am going away and I am coming back to you. If you loved me, you would be glad that I'm going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. Now, if you're familiar with the Trinitarian viewpoint, greater than I would not make sense if they are co-equal, co-eternal, and all that. Now, again, to be fair, you could say, well, it's not greater in you know power or deity or anything. It's just greater in their their role. It's a difference in role. Um, so not not more powerful, not more knowledgeable, anything like that. But I think I think again when we go back and we put it in context of John 14, where Jesus is saying, "Look, the Father indwells me," and then He says, "The Father is greater than I." I I think He's not saying the Father is, has a greater role than I do. I think He's saying the Father is greater. It's the Father that empowers Jesus Christ over and over. You will find in the scriptures where Jesus said, you know, things like, I can't, the things that I do, I, I can't do myself. I do them of the Father. Well, I mean, it's kind of right. I mean, if the Father is the one empowering him, the Father is the one giving him everything, the Father, then it seems to me a pretty good, pretty good construction to believe that the Father is the one God. And getting back to 1 Corinthians 8, 6, that's kind of what it says, right? For us, there is what one God, the Father. <laughs> so, John chapter 20, verse 17, Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet returned to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I'm returning to my Father and your Father. Look at this phrase here, to my God and your God. Now, again, if we just read the scriptures at face value and don't try to do the, uh, well, that's that's not what it really means. What it really means is what it really does not say. If we just say, hey, look, John 20, 17, okay, who is Jesus's God? Does Jesus have a God? Who is his God? Um, he says it's the Father. Now, I know I've heard people say, oh, well, you, you know, do you think Jesus would be an atheist if he's God in the flesh? Um, no, I don't think he'd be an atheist. But I also think it's kind of weird for the second member of a triune God to say that my God is the Father. That does that that seems really, really weird. Think about that. He is God, right? All on his own, right? We've talked about the oneness view versus the Trinitarian view versus the Unitarian view. The scriptures are showing us. I believe, again, you can disagree, and I love you, God bless you. I don't see anything, I don't see any reason not to allow people to disagree on a few of these things here. But here we go. Jesus said, the Father is dwelling in me, right? Thomas calls Jesus God. And I think the scriptures are showing that, yes, Jesus is God by virtue of the Father indwelling him. 
But when you see in the garden where he says, not my will, but thine be done, it's clearly he's praying to the Father, he's talking to the Father, and he says, not my will. So he is a man. It's that man that is saying, you, he is my God. The Father is greater than I, right? And so I'm returning to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Jesus says his God is the Father. It's not the triune God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. I mean, where's the Holy Spirit? Is the Holy Spirit not his God? Um, that's not what he said. He just said the Father. And you find him praying to the Father. You find him over and over talking about the Father indwelling him. You don't see where the, the Holy Spirit is indwelling him. Um, and so again, again, and again, I, I just see the scriptures going back to that 1 Corinthians 8 and 6. For us, there's one God, and that one God is the Father. That would have been a great place for them to say that one God is the triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit. Would have fit perfectly right there, but it didn't. Instead, is he trying to confuse the church? Is he, what is he, why is he saying this? We have the one God, the Father, and we have one Lord, Jesus Christ, which of course he's talking about Messiah. He's talking about that role as a human being, as he, as he said um, in Timothy, right? There's one God and 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 um, one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, that role of the man that bridges the gap between the two. Now, I know this can be confusing, and I know, again, it, of course it is. We said John 14, right? Jesus is talking to him. He's saying, hey, you, 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 from now on, you, you've seen the Father. And it was confusing to the guys that were with him for three years. They were like, huh? What? Go back and watch uh, the last episode because we get deeply into John 14. But let's go on a little bit here. Hebrews 1, 8 and 9 says, but about the Son, he says, your throne, O God, will last forever and ever, and righteousness will be the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has set you above your companions by anointing you with the oil of joy. So here he, it seems to me, he calls the Son God, but then he says, you have a God. And Jesus said that God is the Father. <clears throat> so I think we have them both right here in the same scripture. Jesus can be properly called God because of that full measure. He had no human father. He had the Father, God, indwelling him in a way that has never happened before and hasn't happened since. It's not the same as us having the Holy Spirit, like we can be called God or anything like that. And yet, it's only by virtue of the Father's indwelling that the Son can be called God. The Son in and of himself, the, the human part, the, 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 the descendant of Mary, that is Jesus. He's a man, right? That's the Lord of 1 Corinthians 8 and 6. And so, I think they all just tie together. You know, I don't... I think it's, it's a little... Okay, got to do a little research, got to kind of put these scriptures together, but it's not that hard to understand. Simple statement. Jesus Christ is both God and man. How is he man? Because he, he came from the lineage of people, human beings, Mary. How is he God? Because his father was not human. His father was the father God, indwelling him fully, completely, and therefore he is both God because of the Father's indwelling, and he's man because of the lineage of Mary. Okay. <laughs> I don't see how that's that difficult, but I do if you start to muddy it up with sort of confusion, man-made tradition, especially when you get the tradition side, the creeds and things like that. I, I just don't think they're very helpful um, be, because Scripture explains itself, in my opinion. Now, if you feel like you need a creed, okay, go for it. You know, I can, depending on how that translates into how you preach and teach the gospel and stuff like that, I think, fine, okay, you see it differently, no big deal. I would consider, if somebody asked me, you know, do you believe in the Trinity? I would say, yeah. Well, what do you mean by Trinity, though? Right? Uh, do you just mean Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? I believe that. But do you believe the eternal generation of the sun and the you know the 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 various terms and and nomenclature that certain trinitarians use and do you believe that the father and the son and the holy spirit are all three separate persons in one essence that is that is god 
I would say, mm, show me that in the scripture. That That's it. <laughs> that's what we're trying to do here. Now, we read Hebrews, and I think, again, you properly called God, but he, the, the Father is God. He is the one that indwells Jesus and allowing Jesus to be called God because of that indwelling. But the man, Jesus Christ, that role, that human being, the Father is his God, right? It's not that difficult. And again, we're, we're similar because, yes, we have two earthly parents, but we have God indwelling us, and we pray to God. It's, it's really not that difficult. Matthew 27, 46. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, I know he's quoting from Psalm here, um, the suffering servant and all that stuff, but he is saying, my God, my God. Um, you, we can throw this one out if you want, because we already have John, John 20, 17 to my God and your God. We don't need this to show. Well, Jesus says he has a God, so take it or leave it, but I think it's more evidence along the lines. Luke 18, 19, why do you call me good? Jesus answered, no one is good except God alone. Interesting. Ephesians 1, 3, of course, he is God by virtue of the Father, but there is distinction. There are times when he might he's referencing and talking about himself as human, humanity, right? When he said, I thirst, God doesn't get thirsty. When he slept or sweat or whatever, God doesn't sweat. That was the human side of him. Now, you know, again, you can get into, oh, you're saying side, 50-50 split. No, 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 I'm saying he has a split personality or anything like that. No more than we have a split personality when we receive the Holy Spirit. Um, but I am saying there were times that he spoke as a man and said, I'm hungry or I'm, I'm sad or whatever. And God doesn't get hungry, okay? So, again, he, Ephesians 1, 3, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Wait a minute, he's the God and the Father of the Lord Jesus? Right, our Lord Jesus. When we're talking about Lord Jesus, that's the Christ, that's that that man office, right? Bridging the gap, the propitiation for our sins, all that stuff. 1 Corinthians eleven three. 3, now I want you to realize that the head of every man is Christ, the head of the woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. So it goes God, Christ, man, woman. <clears throat> now there's a hierarchy of roles, and you have God and then Christ. If Christ is, there's not that man side that is not God, right? The, the man side, the man, Jesus Christ. If he's just the eternal triune God the Son, how do you have God and then Christ? He is part of that God. Or are you saying the Father and then Christ? Well, one, where's the Holy Spirit? Nowhere to be found. Two, in a hierarchy of decision-making authority, you're saying the Father has greater decision-making authority than the Son? How can they be co-equal? See, again, if you just throw that stuff out and you say, yeah, there's a Trinity. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Trinity just means three, right? All right, rock, paper, scissors. It's a Trinity game. <laughs> I mean, it's just, there, there's three, right? That's fine. Okay, whatever. What trinity are you talking about? But if you start getting into, again, the two of them, you know, separate from each other as God in this God essence, that's not, where is that in the Bible? Look at this right here. Holy Spirit's left out. The hierarchy doesn't really make sense. But if you say, yes, Jesus is God by virtue of the Father indwelling him, but that means that you can either refer to him as God or you can properly refer to his human, his human side. The humanity, which is the Lord Jesus. And in that case, it's very easy. You can say, yep, God, Christ, man, woman. Pretty easy. John 17, 1 through 3. Father, Jesus praying, right? The time has come. Glorify your Son, that would be Jesus, that your Son, Jesus, may glorify you, right? That's the Father. For you granted him authority over all people that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. So first of all, the Father has to grant authority to the Son. 
How is that possible if he's God the Son? Huh? Didn't he already have it? That doesn't make any sense. But it does make sense if... No, you did not. he did not exist prior to the Incarnation. He had to be granted the authority, right, as the Lord Jesus, the Messiah. Makes perfect sense there. Verse 3, now this is eternal life, that they may know you, he's praying to the Father, that they may know you, the Father, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Again, okay, so Paul says, we opened up with 1 Corinthians 8, 6, for us there's but one God, the Father. Well, maybe Paul was off his rocker. Maybe Paul was just, you know, smoking something that day. You know, I believe the words of Jesus. Well, Jesus says the same thing right here. I want them to know you. This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God. The Father is the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. That would be a great time for him to say that they may know us, the only true God. Why don't? Why does nobody ever say this? Why does Jesus never talk this way? It would be so simple to say that they may know us, the one true God. That would be a perfect scripture to say, aha, there's three persons in one essence, us, the one true God. Didn't say that. You, the one true God, which again fits with you, the one true God, who indwells me, right? And therefore, yeah, I can be called God because of that indwelling. But if you're talking, who is the one true God? It's the Father. It fits so perfectly. Now, again, I think you could try to say, well, oh, see, it says this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Therefore, you don't have eternal life if you don't get this straight, this understanding straight. He didn't say that. He didn't say this is eternal life, that they may understand the Godhead. He said, this is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ. And I definitely believe, I I don't see anywhere in Scripture where you can't know Jesus, know the Father, and not fully understand how they interact and uh, correlate. Your language might not quite fit what the Scriptures teach or whatever. Your, Your understanding isn't as perfect as the Scriptures may want it to be. But you do have relationship. You do know them. You believe in the one God. You believe in the Father. You be, you believe Jesus is Messiah. All of these things. And so I think there's a lot of room for grace here. And I'm happy to be proven wrong. I'm happy to have somebody tell me that's not right because I just want to line up with Scripture. I only care about pleasing God. I only care about believing what the Scripture teaches. I don't care about holding to some denominational, like, you know, I think that's like, this is a good time to say this. Maybe I'll make a note here and say it again in another context, you know, sometime. But I just just read the scriptures and check, check yourself. If the thought comes into your mind that you have to believe a certain way because of, and then you can fill in the blank, but it's not scripture. Well, what would my dad think? What would my pastor think? What would this organization think? Would I lose my church? Would I lose my congregation? Would I get kicked out of the church? Would I? If, all, if that is part of the reason you believe what you believe, that's dangerous ground to be on. Because that means you might be believing something that's not true or scriptural for reasons other than just wanting to please God, wanting to be part of the, the kingdom of God. I personally only care about pleasing God. I, only, I will change my belief again three times, five times, as long as I'm trying to change and line up with Scripture. That's all I care about. I don't care about pleasing you. I don't care about pleasing people around me. I don't care about pleasing some organization that I'm be beholden to. They're holding my license over my head, or they're holding my church over my head. And now I'm talking to you. I am talking to you, pastor watching this, an elder, somebody in leadership, somebody that's rooted in the church, that's got a lot of family in a church somewhere or whatever. And you're struggling with this, but you don't want to believe the truth of Scripture, and it has nothing to do with you just want to please Jesus. It has everything to do with you're scared. That is not the Holy Ghost. That is not God. That is not Scripture. And believing something that's false because you're looking at Scripture and studying it and don't quite get that, I think there's some grace in certain areas for that. But believing something that's false intentionally because you're afraid of what the repercussions might be, 
I don't think that's the same. And I do think people in that boat, those kinds of people will be judged harshly by God because there's a difference, again, in certain areas, not like salvation and, oh, I, yeah, I believe in Buddha. I just didn't know. No. But I do think there's certain places where we're telling God, no, we're actually being disobedient to Jesus. Disobedience is sin. And so if God is leading you to start believing and understanding Scripture, you need to do it and not worry about the repercussions. And I would say find a good body of Christ. I'm available. You know where to reach me. Um, but that you can be in fellowship with and con connect with if, uh, if those repercussions might be severe enough to get you booted. But um, hey, guess what? The apostles all lay down their, their lives. So what do you have to be concerned about? Hmm. Ah, now, Ephesians 4, 6. There's one God and Father of all who is over all, through all, and in you all, and in all. Sorry. <clears throat> one God and Father. You know, it'd be nice to, you know, them, they. It's not there. 1 Corinthians 11, 3. Um, oh, I already read that one, didn't we? That the, uh, the head of Christ is God. Now, Jesus clearly recognized and served God as the, you know, the Father. And uh, how can we have a couple of co-equal, co-eternal persons if one recognizes the other as their God? Now, you don't see anywhere where the Father recognizes the Son as His God. So it's like a mutual, the Son's God is the Father, and the Father's God is the Son. You don't see that anywhere. In scripture, you see one God, the Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ, who can be properly called God because of the indwelling of the Father. And I've said this before, if the Father wants to designate somebody as God, his representative, his Christ, his ambassador, whatever, he can do so. He's God. I don't tell God what to do, you don't tell God what to do. Um, and that's that's just kind of that, right? He's God. So, we have to be careful. We have to be very careful that we follow the scriptures. Mark 13, 32, no one knows about that day or hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Now that is interesting, right? He's saying the Son does not know. Only the Father knows. Well, if they were co-equal, shouldn't the Son know too? Now again, it's pretty simple, but I've, there are lots of people who are trying to explain this away. Well, you see, what, what that really means, what he's really saying. I had, you know, I, I've had people actually explain this away in a way that is totally, there's nothing in Scripture that says anything about it. It's just what they know about history. Okay, whatever. If that's what you're going to go with. But once you start stepping outside of the Bible, conversation's over. <coughs> Me personally, when people step outside of the Bible and start explaining things away outside of Scripture. So Scripture's not interpreting Scripture anymore. Not Sola Scriptura. It's Sola Scriptura plus this uh, really cool fact of history that I that I learned that has to explain away a key passage in the, in the Bible. Okay, at that point, I'm not going to push back. Conversation's over. Oh, okay, great. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, glad you see it that way. Well, I'm not glad you see it that way, but oh, okay, cool. Yeah, right. Oh, whatever, dude. Um, I don't have anything more to say. Because when we're talking Bible things, Bible is it, right? If you reach for a denominational handbook, if you reach for a creed, oh, look at this, what they had to say about in this creed of, you know, whatever, Constantinople or Nicaea or whatever it is, doesn't really matter. At that point, that's not the Bible. And if that's what you're leaning on, you know, oh, look at this confession over here, these wise men. They might be wise, but they might have got this wrong. I only rely on Scripture. Forget that junk. Revelation 1.1, 1, 1. the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant, John. Wait, wait, God gave, huh? Who, what, when, what? God gave something to Jesus to give to, uh, what? How is that possible if he is an eternal God the Son? Luke 22.42, Father, if you're willing, take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. We read that last time. Two wills. The Son is saying, I don't want to do this. That's not my will. But it's your will, and I will submit my will to yours. If they are co-eternal, 
and co-equal, it is impossible for them to have differing opinions on something. Even if you say, well, Jesus laid down his divine prerogatives, and he, and he came as a man, but he was really God. Even if you say that, it's still impossible for them to have separate desires. That's impossible. Yet, Jesus said, I would prefer not to go through with this. But I will submit my will to yours. Now, it doesn't make sense to have, you know, a trinity or a du or a, uh, uh, a duality. What would the two be? Binary, I guess. Binity. A binary or what a binity. Um, but yeah, I guess a binitarian, right? It, it, it wouldn't make any sense anyway, right? Because two wills, and the two wills are not perfectly in lockstep. But if you have God indwelling a man, and that man has his own will, he has his own mind, he has his own, you know, he's a person, his own person. And that man says, I am aligned with you, God, Father, right? If there's a way to do this, get this done without me going to the cross, I'd prefer that. But not my will, but yours be done. That's the way, that's that's it, right? Because he says, if you are willing, take this cup from me. So his will is take this cup from me. But the father's will was, no, it's got to be this way. At simple reading of scripture, easy, right? Might go against tradition, might go against family beliefs from generation to generation, might go against a denominational handbook, might go against a creed or a confession, but who cares? All those things are just, you know, maybe helpful man-made guides, but once a, hel a helpful man-made guide comes into conflict with Scripture, you chuck the helpful hand-made guide. Acts 1-7, he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by His own authority. This is after he's risen. This is after the cross. Why is he still talking like the Father is the one that knows stuff and, and is in control, and he's the Son and subject to the Father? Why is that? Because he's the Son subject to the Father, right? John 7, 16-17, Jesus answered, My teaching is not my own. It comes from him who sent me. If anyone chooses to do God's will, he will find out whether my teaching comes from God or whether I speak on my own. So he's speaking of the Father. He calls the Father God here, obviously. He says his teaching is not his own. <clears throat> Again, how can that be? Even if he laid down his divine prerogatives, even if he said, hey, you know what? I'm not going to go in bright, glorious, shining. I'm going to humble myself as a man. And I'm going to go to the earth. But his teaching is still his. The three-in-one God concept, the teaching would still be his. He laid aside his divine prerogative, and he abandoned his teaching and abandoned his will and abandoned the idea that they had from eternity past. And I don't think so. That doesn't make any sense. And there's nowhere in Scripture that says anything about that. You can try to use Philippians 2, which we'll talk about Philippians 2, I think, in a different podcast specifically. You can try to use that to say, well, he he abandoned his divine prerogative. Okay, okay, I'll give that to you. But he also abandoned the teaching and the idea the three came up with with the incarnation and then said, not my will, but yours be done. That makes no sense, and you can't prove that from Philippians. That is ridiculous. Actually, it's worse than ridiculous. It's man made tradition being inserted, eisegesis, into Scripture. That's what's happening. And you can use, you know, the, the comma Johannium and, 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 and <laughs> right? You can use all, all, now again, right, may or may not be in there. <laughs> but even that, if it's, you take that and it's inserted into 1 John, and you say, well, I believe that is actually part of the original, okay. But it says these three are one. Or you can use cool language like, is it the Corpus Christi, the, the Philippians 2, the song unto Christ, and all this stuff. Look, you can use flowery language in Latin and Greek and try to impress your friends, but it's not impressive. Okay? It's not impressive. What's impressive is what the Scripture says. 
And the scripture does not say that Jesus abandoned the teaching that he, the Father, and the Holy Spirit all agree needs to happen, and then came to earth and then said, Jesus answered, my teaching is not my own, but it came from him who sent me, which is the Father. If anyone chooses to do God's will, he will find out whether my teaching comes from God or whether I speak on my own. Once again, came from the Father, not of the Son. How can you say they're co co-equal and co-eternal if that's the case? You can't. Well, you can't scripturally. You can, but I don't believe Scripture supports that, that position. I just don't think it works. Now, I... Um, I know we're we're hitting a lot here. We are hitting a lot. This is a this is a heavily um, scripture focused um, session. Please go back and and look through some of these references. I'll run through the references real quick. If you want to grab a pen, pencil, whatever, go play this back. We've gone through First Corinthians eight and six. For us, there's one God, the Father. John fourteen twenty eight. The Father is greater than I. John twenty seventeen my God and your God, right? Jesus speaking of the Father, right? My God, your God. Hebrews 1, 8, 9, God, your God, has set you above your companions. Matthew 27, 46, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Luke 18, 19, no good, none good except God alone. Ephesians 1, 3, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 11, 3, the head of Christ is God. John 17, 1 through 3, you are as Jesus prays to the Father, he identifies him as the Father. You, the only true God. Jesus Christ calls the Father the only true God in John 17, 1 through 3. Ephesians 4, 6, there is one God and Father of all. We've also hit Mark 13, 32, where it says, only the Father knows. <clears throat> Didn't say the Son knows, but decided to lay that aside. It says, only the Father knows. Revelation um, one one, God gave Jesus the revelation. Right? Why would He have to do that? Doesn't He already have it? Luke twenty two forty two. Not my will, but Yours be done. Acts one seven. Right? The Father has set these things by His own authority. John seven sixteen through seventeen. My teaching is not my own. The teaching comes from God. <clears throat> Lots of scripture. Lots of scripture. Now, I want to go through a couple more things here. We're still kind of good on time. And I want to hit a few sort of sort of extra extra things here. We're going to go to John 1:18. No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. Now that's KJV and you can say one and only Son. Um the monogenes whole debate or whatnot that we talked about one or two sessions ago. You can go look at it. But Hebrews 1.5 says, For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day I have begotten thee, and again I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. The son had an incarnation, a point in time. This day I have begotten thee. Now you can say, well, a day is like a thousand years. or Okay, whatever. That's not what this is saying. Today today, this day, the common use of the word day, um, even if it was a day in eternity past, right? The eternal generation of the Son is not scriptural. So then you have the incarnation, okay? Well, Hebrews 5.5, 5, so also Christ glorified not himself to be made an high priest, but he that said to him, thou art my son, today I have I begotten thee. Hmm, so Jesus came to glorify who? The one who brought him into being, his, his, the, the one who made him the one and only son. That's the Father. The importance here is that he had a beginning. Scriptural, biblical, right? The teaching is he had a beginning. He did. The incarnation. Now you can say, well, you know, okay, that's, uh, that's true, but it's still, you know, at that point, you know, there, there's, there's, there's still a, a Trinitarian understanding of, of three persons, one essence, um, but it, it, it's much more difficult to hold on to scripturally. 
Hebrews 1, 3 through 4, the sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. So he became as much superior to the angels as this as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. So he inherited his name. He didn't have it originally. He inherited it from who? The Father. You see that? Colossians 1.5, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. He's the image or the representation of the one true God. Hmm. John 5.43, I have come in my Father's name, and you do not accept me, but if someone else comes in his own name, you will accept him. Where did Jesus get his name from? Where did Jesus get that name from? Where did he get the name from? What was his name? Jesus, uh, you know, Yeshua, um, uh, God, our, our salvation, Jehovah, our salvation, or Jehovah salvation, right? It is a revelation of who God is, but he got his name, his, the name Yahweh or Jehovah is within his name, Jesus. Now, how did he get his name? Well, Joseph and Mary were told what to name this kid, okay? It wasn't like, well, here's a list of 10 things, or just, you know, name him whatever. What's in a name? Oh, no. It was like, no, his name will be Jesus. Okay, why? Because he will, Matthew 121, he will save his people from their sins. Jehovah, salvation, Jehovah saves, Jehovah is our salvation, you know, however you want to look at their Yahweh. <clears throat> his name, Jesus, came as an inheritance from the Father. Check that out. Well, how do you inherit something you already have? That is impossible. That, that, that defeats the common vernacular of the human language. Unless there's an incarnation and not an eternal generation. And the Son came into the world, born of a woman, human side, but no human father, God side, God part of him, right? Wrapped into one package who was both God and man, the God-man. Kind of, I mean, yeah, it's okay. Got to wrap your brain around it because it's a unique situation, but it's not that hard to, to see, to, to understand. The Father fully indwelling this human being, the Messiah, the Christ, one of a kind, right? One and only Son. It's not that difficult. Now, we talked a little bit about history or, you know, creeds and these types of things. I want to go through a couple of things here. I'm just going to read them in succession, and I'm going to leave it there, I think, for this for this podcast. But I do want to show you some things from historical sources, okay? Canny's Encyclopedia of Religions, okay, the 1970 version, page 53. Persons were baptized at first in the name of Jesus Christ or in the name of the Lord Jesus. Afterwards, with the development of the doctrine of the Trinity, they were baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Encyclopedia Britannica, 11th edition, 1920, volume 2, page 365. The Trinitarian formula and trine immersion were not uniformly used from the beginning. Baptism into the name of the Lord was the normal formula of the New Testament. In the third century, baptism in the name of Christ was still so widespread that Pope Stephen, in opposition to Cyprian of Carthage, declared it to be valid. Hmm? Encyclopedia, Encyclopedia Biblica, 1899, volume 1, page 473. It is natural to conclude that baptism was administered in the earliest times, right? Before men got their tradition in there, before creeds started coming out, before confessions started getting popular. Administered in the early times in the name of Jesus Christ or in that of the Lord Jesus. This view is confirmed by the fact that he, oh, that he, huh, that the earliest forms of the baptismal confession appear to have been single, not triple, 
as was the later creed. In other words, they baptize in the name of Jesus, not in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. The Catholic Encyclopedia, Volume 2, page 263, the baptismal formula was changed from the name of Jesus Christ to the words Father, Son, and Holy Spirit by the Catholic Church in the second century. Really? Hmm. Changed. Against Praxius, chapter 3, paragraph 1, all simple people, you know, those basic, simple morons who only want to stick to Scripture and not know all the confessions and creeds and traditions of great thinkers and philosophers and theologians. All simple people, not to say the unwise and unprofessional, who always constitute the majority of believers, since even the rule of faith itself removes, from, removes them from the plurality of the gods of this world to the one true God, became greatly terrified through their failure to understand that while he must be believed to be one, it is along with his economy, because they judge that economy implying a number and arrangement of trinity, is really a division of unity, whereas unity deriving trinity from itself is not destroyed by it, but made serviceable. In other words, right, really flowery, great construct of language, I suppose. In other words, all these morons who just, they're just dumb, just simple people, simpletons, they think God is actually only one, a unity. They don't realize he's a trinity. Three in one, which doesn't destroy the unity, the one God, but there's three persons in that one God. Now, that was a long time ago. You can look it up online, against Praxius, against Praxius, chapter 3, paragraph 1. But even in, in the very early stages of Christianity, first couple hundred years, we have like letters, people saying that who always constitute the majority of believers. He's saying that there's these massive majority of people who believe there's only one God in unity. But they're not smart enough to realize there's a trinity. Who does that sound like today? I hate, I'm not trying to dog on Trinitarians, because they don't all feel that way. But I've watched and listened to many, 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 many dozens and do scores, maybe even hundreds of hours of debates and lectures and things like that. And there's a, there is a little bit of that, I'm smarter than you, so shut up attitude. I know Greek, I know Hebrew, I know more history, I teach at such and such seminary, and therefore what I have to say has more weight. That still kind of emanates from some people, not all, not all, I want to be fair, not all. But that attitude goes all the way back to here, and probably even before this. Even though most people see God as a unity, because that's the easiest thing to draw from Scripture, it's the plainest thing from Scripture, you have to read, if you believe Trinitarianism, true, like, three persons, one essence, you got to really kind of carve that out, and you kind of need a creed or somebody to kind of show that to you. You're not going to read the Bible and just get that. Now, I'm not saying you're going to read the Bible and there's not a little bit of scratch in your head like, hmm, how's this work? But you're not going to read the Bible and come away going, oh yeah, three persons, one essence, oh, it's so easy. No, you will not. The New Schaff Herzog Encyclopedia of Religious Knowledge, Volume 1, page 435. Jesus, however, cannot have given his disciples the Trinitarian order of baptism after his resurrection. Why? For the New Testament knows only baptism in the name of Jesus. Then it gives some references, Acts 2.38. 616, 95, Galatians 327, Romans 6, 3, 1 Corinthians um, 13 through 15. Hmm. Is that 1 Corinthians 1? They use these Roman numeral systems. Anyway, uh, it says, which still occurs even in the second and third centuries. Wait a minute, what? Let's read that again. Jesus cannot have given his disciples a Trinitarian or this Trinitarian order of baptism after his resurrection? Why? For the New Testament, ah, going only back to the Scriptures, knows only baptism in the name of Jesus, 
which still occurs even in the second and third centuries. Now, we are getting a little bit into history, I get that, and the only reason I'm doing so is not to prove anything, except that that's where the development of Trinitarian thinking happened. It didn't happen in the Bible. It happened after the Bible. Um, the Nicene Creed, the Nicene Creed, right, 325, 325. Now, isn't it interesting that in all of these, uh, Canny's Encyclopedia, Encyclopedia Britannica, Encyclopedia Biblica, the Catholic Encyclopedia, against Praxias, the new Schaff Herzog, Encyclopedia of Religious Knowledge, all of them, rep, may, if they make reference to a date or a time frame, they talk about like the second and third century, right? But once you start getting past that, that's where the triune understanding, at least of baptism, really came in and came to be, where it came, came, came into use. Why? Around that time is when they started having those creeds and declaring, making proclamations like the Trinitarian formula, and then persecuting and even killing and ostracizing and a bunch of heretics, anybody who lost those polit those religio-political debates in the time they were coming up with those creeds. That's what happened. So why am I saying this? Because I'm going back to the scriptures that I already laid out, gave them all twice now, right? When you read the scriptures, you come away with a different viewpoint of God. But when you look across, you survey Christian denominations, many people believe in a triune God, a trinity. But that's because we're not 4th or 5th or 6th century. We're in the 21st century. We have had tons and tons and tons of time for these changes, right? The Catholic Encyclopedia literally says it was changed, <laughs> right? It was changed from Jesus or the Lord Jesus or Jesus Christ to a Father, Son, Holy Spirit, right? That is not the way it was done in the Bible. It's not. Because they had a understanding of the unity of God. Not just oneness. I mean, not just God is one, but he's singular unity one. God, who is the one God? The Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. See that? Now, I do believe they refer to Jesus as God properly, not nearly as much as they refer to the Father as God. And I think that's because, again, he can rightly be called God because of the Father indwelling him the way he did. No human, no human lineage on the Father's side, unlike any man before then or since. And so I think it's good to go back to history to show that history is honest. These things were changed. The Nicene Creed, when you get into it, 325 AD. I mean, that is couple of, that is hundreds of years after the apostles, I'm not going to put my my belief system in a creed that came, you know, 250 years after all the apostles were dead. <laughs> okay, that and sorry, I'm just not going to do it. I'm going to go back to scripture, and I'm going to form my belief system based off of what the scriptures teach. Now, I, I'm not saying it can't be confusing. I'm not saying there's not like a little bit of yeah, you got to do a little, re, you know, little researching of the Bible, okay, of the scriptures. You got to do a little putting scriptures together and, you know, kind of looking at it. But it, it it's not that difficult to comprehend, and it's really not that difficult to get out of scripture if you put that on the topic board and look for the scriptures that kind of kind of hit that topic or read through and, and look at it. It really is not that difficult. So where have we where have we gotten so far? One, there's one God. Clearly, Old Testament, New Testament clearly shows that. Two, that Jesus Christ can rightly be called God because he's the God-man. The Father indwelt him in a way that never came before and or since. He wasn't a theophany. He wasn't God for, you know, just ra wrapping a, a, a blanket around him that's flesh. No, he was a man. He had his own will, his own mind, his own emotions, all that stuff. But he was also God, no human lineage from the Father's side. His humanity came from Mary's side. 
Then we have just surveyed the scripture in great detail, but I have not exhausted it. There's a lot more we could add. It's just, it's getting long. But we see that Jesus recognized the Father. We ended last session John with John 14, and we did all the scriptures this time, talking about how Jesus recognized the Father as God. The one true God is the Father. We see that Paul also taught this to the Corinthians, so it was not, it, it was a consistent theme throughout the church. And we've looked at historically where these various encyclopedias and different things are open and honest about the fact that even in baptism, people, it took, a, it took a couple hundred years for people to start baptizing in this triune understanding. Why? Because that was around the same time that the understanding of the Trinity started to become widespread. People started to believe the Trinity. People did not believe the Trinity prior to, I mean, at least 200, 250, something like that. Um, and it certainly wasn't widespread until you had, you know, the, the discussions in 325 and all that stuff. So at this point, I think it's safe to say the scriptures teach there is but one God, that that one God, the Father, indwelt a human being named Jesus Christ, that Jesus was God with us, by virtue of the Father indwelling him, that he can properly be called God, but that he was Messiah. He was also a man. He was the man, Christ Jesus, that mediator that Paul spoke of to Timothy. He is the propitiation for our sins. He is the one Lord, right? As a man, he is that Lord. Hebrews, we talked about it in the last session. He had to be made like his brethren, right? In every way. He is that last man, Adam, that last Adam versus the first Adam, right? He was God and man, a God-man. I believe that's a, you know, a fine term to use, even though the Bible doesn't use that term. I think it, it explains it, and you can see it in the Bible. That's the main thing, is the concept there in the Bible. So, I really, I, I think that's what the Scriptures teach. Now, if you want to say, oh, that's the Trinity, okay, then that's the Trinity. I believe the Trinity. Um, I do not believe that, that the Bible teaches three persons in one essence, three who's in one what, three co-eternal, co-equal, and we'll, and we'll talk more about that. We'll talk more about that next time. We'll dive really into kind of looking at the Trinity, and we'll put this all in the context of the Holy Spirit, because we've talked a lot about the Father and the Son, but what about the Holy Spirit? I mean, the Holy Spirit gets left out of all these things. If he is just as co-equal and co-eternal and all that stuff, and he's different than the other two, why isn't he mentioned? Right, But if the Holy Spirit is not different from the other two, and by virtue of mentioning one of the other two, <laughs> right, give a little hint here, that that is the Holy Spirit, well, then it makes sense, because you don't need to mention him all the time, because he's not separate. He's not a third option here, or a third person. And we will get heavily into that, I think, in the next in the next episode. I'm really looking forward to it. I hope you're enjoying this, and I hope it's very informative. Please don't take my word for it. Be Berean. Be Berean. Okay, go the Berean way, go search it in Scripture, but search it in Scripture and then come back if you've got questions or, you know, something I'm missing, please. Hey, I'm open, so correct me, teach me, show me. Um, but show me from the Scripture, not a creed, not a denominational handbook, not my wise pastor once said. Nope, show me in the Bible, show me in the Scriptures. Explain how my, the Scriptures I've given and show how they don't fit or they don't make sense. And we can sit down, break bread. But the Berean way is to go and look at the scriptures, not to go and look at, you know, the Constantinople Creed or whatever. Um, it's to look at the scriptures. Open the Bible and, sh and show what the position the scriptures teach. Um, again, I'll leave it right there. This has been fun. I hope it's been um, uh, a, you know, a great source of knowledge and understanding. It's a lot, so please go back. Go back to the scriptures, read them again, pray over them, and then read them again. But um, but scripture and scripture alone is what needs to be the thing uh, that forms our doctrinal beliefs. Love you guys. God bless you. And we will catch you on the next podcast. Hey guys, hope you enjoyed that content from Bread Breakers. If you enjoyed the content, give us that thumbs up. And if you have any suggestions on future content or anything like that, don't forget to leave us a comment in the comment section. Also, subscribe and hit that notification bell. That way, every time we put out something new, a new video, a new interview, whatever it might be, 
you will be notified. We will throw some additional videos and playlists up here on the screen. And as always, God bless you. We'll catch you on the next video.